Thanks for listening to the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry, here to help educate, motivate, and put you on the right path to take control of your health through weekly discussions on topics in the medical field, public health arena, and in your community. And now your host, Dr. Barry. And welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry. This is episode 39. And like always, please head over to drpierresblog.com forward slash LLP 039 for today's show notes. If you want today's show notes, please go to drpierresblog.com forward slash LLP 039. And on today's episode, we are going to be talking about Why do we dress up in pink in October, right? We're going to be talking about breast cancer, and it's one of the more deadlier diseases that um, I face in an outpatient as well as inpatient uh, basis. And it's something that in the month of October gets a lot of fanfare. And if you happen to catch my Lunch and Learn last week, uh, you know that uh, a lot of it kind of, you know, delves from the fact that, you know, there's so many diseases that talk about that some of them don't get as much popularity as others. Uh, but, you know, as you'll start seeing, especially over the course of this month where everything starts becoming, you know, about the color pink. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about, you know, why they chose the color pink. When did all this start? And more importantly, we're just going to be talking about breast cancer. And we're going to give you some uh, some tips, some what is breast cancer, risk factors, some signs and symptoms, treatment courses as well. So stay tuned and uh, get ready for another great episode. All right. So today we're going to be talking about breast cancer. This is going to be an important topic, especially uh, being that depending on when you're listening to this, uh, the month of October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Not day, not week, month. So a whole month is dedicated to breast cancer, the disease of breast cancer, the awareness of breast cancer. And I definitely wanted to make sure that I touched on it on a podcast. One, so we can understand, especially from a health standpoint, just what is breast cancer. Because again, you may have heard that term a lot and you're going to be hearing about it a lot and you're going to be seeing things, especially when we talk about uh, wearing pink, you're going to be seeing that all throughout the month. And then come November, it's going to stop abruptly. So I want to make sure that when November comes around, that you're still kind of thinking about breast cancer and making sure you do all that you can to try to prevent the preventable death. So let's talk about breast cancer. Again, just in the quick layman's term, breast cancer is really, again, cancerous cells that develop in the tissue of the breast or the lymph nodes of the breast. And it is something that affects women much more uh, predominantly than it affects men. You'll, uh, we'll talk about how one in eight women will develop breast cancer in their life. But I want to first start off in, you know, uh, the reason why I like to do these things, especially from the podcast standpoint, uh, from a patient case, right? So I have a 55-year-old female who is coming in, come, and these, these are all real cases, 55-year-old female who came in to see me for her routine checkup. Now, this is a female who had no prior visit to a doctor's office in like the past five years. But thankfully for, you know, the Affordable Care Act plan, she was able to get things taken care of. She was able to, you know, have insurance and then she wanted to kind of get everything kind of square the way. So she came to the doctor's office, which means she came to see me. And what I usually do for all of my annual visits is I pretty much kind of go through, you know, a top down approach and making sure everything's OK, making sure all the medications, all labs. And at the end, I always try to, you know, top off and end with any screening exams. Right. And for that age group, you know, over the age of 50, you know, the mammogram is a big one. Colonoscopy is another one. Making sure they're getting their flu shots is another one. Uh, depending on the age, uh, if they have uh, been screened for hepatitis C. But again, we're today we're focusing on, you know, breast cancer, right? So I asked her about her mammogram and I asked her when was the last time she actually had one. And her answer, again, like, like we time to discuss, was about 10 years ago. Because it had been about 10 years since the last time she had insurance. Uh, 
So it's been about 10 years since she had a mammogram. She started getting them at the age of 40. And she had beginning them up until, uh, you know, she lost her insurance. And then she kind of went 10 years without. And any time I get a history like that, especially in uh, the outpatient uh, practice, I get I get kind of scared a little bit, right? Because I know, you know, this is a test when we talk about the mammogram. We'll talk about it a little bit later. This is a test that you have to get pretty frequently. So to see that it's been 10 years since the last time she got hers, you know what? My antennas already go up. So, you know, we order the mammogram, we get the mammogram for her, and of course it comes back abnormal. Why? Because, you know, that's what tends to happen when they don't, you know, get their routine screening done on a, you know, on a routine basis. So it came back abnormal, and this was a lady when I talked to her, the only history, only history she had uh, was that she was a smoker. That's all. She was a smoker. She had no family history, no other family members associated with uh, breast cancer. Uh, in in her family, so when you know push came to shove, and after all of our diagnostic testing, she was positive for breast cancer. And you know, I want to kind of start it out there because that's not an uncommon scenario, a scenario where you have no real signs or symptoms of you know what could possibly be breast cancer, but after we do some diagnostic imaging, lo and behold, that's what we found. And so I want to go, let's go, let's go right into like, what are some, some, some interesting breast cancer facts, right? And I talked about this on my lunch and learn. So I just want to kind of reiterate one in eight women, one in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of death in women and is the second most commonly diagnosed cancer in women. Uh, we know skin is uh, the first first common. Uh, under the age of 45, African-American women are more likely and more uh, prone to develop breast cancer. And unfortunately, they're also more likely to die from breast cancer. Here in the United States, we're going to get about over 250,000 women and men, but mostly women, will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Over 40,000 women will die for breast cancer. And just to give it to you in a, a timely, uh, you know, picture so you can kind of, you know, visualize what those numbers mean. Every two minutes, a woman will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Every two minutes. Think about that, right? So that's the amount of, uh, that's how many people are getting breast cancer, right? And again, that's why, you know, I think it, it takes up a whole month. Uh, because uh, this isn't something that a disease that you know only happens to a few people. This is a very prevalent disease, and this is something that you know what <laughs> when everyone starts wearing pink and everyone starts really going into you know promo mode, you know that's the reason why. And and just kind of segue uh, when I, I was looking up to even find out like what was the reason why they even wore pink, and come to find out. In the year 1993, uh, Estee Lauder, which is like that makeup company, right, uh, founded uh, a nonprofit organization called the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. And it was then when they established, you know, the pink ribbon, you know, as uh, the symbol for breast cancer. Right. And so it was in 1993 is when that symbol, the pink ribbon, which you're going to see a lot of this month was established as the uh, symbol for breast cancer, breast cancer awareness in that regards. So when we're talking about breast cancer, again, we talked about our lady uh, in in the first case, uh, who was this 55-year-old female with no history but the fact that she smoked, right? So what are some risk factors for breast cancer, right? Because again, I think that's important, right? Again, especially if you want to educate yourself and uh, know when you need to get tested, right? You got to know what are some risk factors to look out for. So number one, age. Age is uh, one of the biggest risk factors. The older women get, the more likely they will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Gender obviously is a huge factor. And women, one in eight will be diagnosed with breast cancer. And men, one in 1,000. So again, and I I really want to stress that one in 1,000 just so uh, we understand that men can get breast cancer as well. Like this is not, 
a disease that's exclusively to women. But it is one that happens to them so much more frequently that a lot of the fanfare goes towards them. But I just do want to remember, especially when we start talking about the signs and symptoms, uh, we also need to be concerned about these things in a man as well. Genetics. Genetics plays a huge factor when we talk about family history being huge. And a lot of times, especially when we're doing our histories in the outpatient office, uh, even if you you know don't have no personal history, a breast cancer, I'm making sure, you know, what about mom? What about sisters? What about aunts? What about grandmas? Because we need, and even again, even and even on the male side, because we need to know, because again, that puts you at a higher risk because you may not have any personal history of it. But if you got a good, strong family history, that's something to keep in mind of. And that actually will change some of our diagnostic testing uh, that we tend to do. And we'll talk about diagnostic testing towards the end today. Obesity. Obesity has been found to show a link in breast cancer. And for those who are wondering why, uh, obesity and fat tissue tends to have uh, more elevated levels of estrogen. And breast cancer is, there's a big hormonal aspect when it comes to breast cancer, developing breast cancer. So they figure and they, they kind of show some correlation that with women who are obese, and have tend to have more fat deposition, and because they have them the more fat deposition, they're going to have uh, more cells that produce those hormones, and that are concerning for breast cancer. Not having children, so those who don't have children also show a propensity for an increased risk of breast cancer. Those who have high dense breasts, again another risk factor. Uh, those who have an early menstrual cycle. So by early menstrual cycle, I mean ones who may have started when they were 13, 14, 15, or 9, 10, like really early, right? Again, and remember, I'm an internist, right? Don't quote me on these on um, when an, a good age is for uh, women menstrual cycle because I don't know. That's, that's one thing I will you know always hang my hat on as I know a lot about what I know. And the stuff I don't, which usually includes women's health, is that stuff I kind of leave alone. Uh, smoking, especially, and I remember in our case, uh, she was just a huge smoker. And if you've been following me, you know how much I hate the smokers. And alcohol use. So increased alcohol use is another risk factor associated with breast cancer. So let's move on to the signs and symptoms, right? Let's move on to what you need to look for. When it's time to say, you know what, I need to go get this checked out. Swelling of the breast is a, a big one. And I know, especially for my women who with menstrual cycles may have changes in the size of the breast, may have changes in the tenderness of the breast. We're not talking about that. Uh, we're talking very abnormal areas of swelling, like localized. We're talking about lumps and masses. Those are probably the most biggest determinant considerations for breast cancer. We're talking about when we're, we're talking in regards to the nipples, nipple retraction, nipple discharge, also risk factors associated uh, with breast cancer and uh, breast pain in general. Again, this is not usually a pain associated with your menstrual cycle, but it's just always in pain, always in discomfort. So those are just a list of the few of the risk factors associated with breast cancer. So I definitely want to make sure. You know, we have a good grasp on it because, you know, th these are some of the questions that your doctors uh, will be asking you, especially when they're trying to see, you know, what what risk you are to develop breast cancer. Again, we had uh, that first patient who, again, didn't really have the only risk factor she had uh, was her age for sure, was her gender for sure. But the fact that she smoked, right, that was a big one uh, for her. And so so what do we do from from here on out, right? Um, I, I want to talk about uh, another patient of mine's, uh, and that was in my office as well. So this was, you know, a 34-year-old female. So 34-year-old female came into my office because she had some breast pain, but she also noticed this, like, lump in her breast, right? And she was concerned, right? And she was one of the patients who kind of followed my direction uh, for, you know, patients I've always advocated, especially when it comes to 
breast health is to always be doing manual exams, usually out the shower. It's very quick. It's very easy because a lot of times you're not going to be able to tell whether, you know, your your breast is in pain or discomfort unless you're actually, you know, examining it yourself. Right. So, you know, a difference if there's a lump there that shouldn't be there. And, you know, she had been doing what, you know, what I instructed her to do. And one day she came back and said, hey, hey, Dr. Barry, this is a lump. Uh, on on my breast that I noticed it's it's not painful it's but it is there so I wanted to kind of get that looked at so she came in and again when we talk about risk factors you know just a quick you know update you know she is a 36 year old female so she's pretty young like so she's actually on the young side right we don't start even looking especially from an imaging standpoint for breast cancer until they hit the age of 40. So this is a young girl who comes into the office and, you know, she finds this lump on her breast. But in her case, right, especially when I started doing my history and, you know, trying to really dig down deep, come to find out that not only did she have her sister who was diagnosed with breast cancer, but also her mother who was diagnosed with breast cancer. So this is a person with a huge, huge red alert from a family history standpoint that says, I need to get this address ASAP because she has the lump of the mass, which, again, is one of the biggest uh, concerns when we're talking about breast cancer. But she has a strong family history. So even though her age may not be the quote unquote, you know, right time to be getting breast cancer. And for those you know who have any family members or friends with breast cancer, you know, there's never a right time or right age uh, to get breast cancer. Uh, but, you know, she had all of the other symptoms that said, you know, I need to be mindful uh, that this may be breast cancer. So uh, we sent her to do uh, the test that we tend to do, especially for all of our patients who are concerning that to be having breast cancer. And again, she was another one who ended up having it. And in her case, it was the fact that her family history is so strong that the likelihood of her not having it uh, was very low. In, in that case, right? So we, in, so I talked about like sending those two patients that I talked about today. So I talked about today sending those two patients to do diagnostic imaging. So what are some imaging tests? What are some diagnostic tests that we do when we're looking to see, you know, is this brain cancer? I'm sorry. What are some diagnostic testing that we do on the outpatient basis or even in the patient basis, but mostly outpatient basis? that we do to see if this person may have breast cancer. So number one, right? Number one, probably the gold standard is the mammogram, right? Number two is the breast ultrasound. Number three, the breast MRI. Number four, uh, we'll sometimes do some genetic testing. And in a person uh, like my last patient I talked about, the one with that strong family history, she's one where we have to start thinking about, you know what, I need to like make sure there's not a genetic component associated with this breast cancer because that will change the management, right? So in, in our case, and I'll tell you, in our case, we she was, all, she was also BRCA1 and BRCA2 positive, right? So she had genetic risk factors that were significant for a risk of developing breast cancer. So not only did she have this lump and she had the genes for it, uh, but she had a strong family history that said, you know what, this might be breast cancer. And the reason why it's important to have that is because our management actually changes. Initially, in her case alone, it was very localized and it was something that we probably could have did from a surgical standpoint and just took that area out. And not have to do, you know, a, a full-blown mastectomy, which is pretty much removal of the uh, breast tissue. Uh, but in her case, because she was significant uh, enough from a genetic standpoint, from a risk factor, she elected to actually have a bilateral mastectomy, right? So she actually, again, 36-year-old, actually elected to have bilateral mastectomy. Both her, both her breast uh, tissue was essentially removed, because the risk of her developing breast cancer was so high at a later age that she did not want to have to deal with it at that time. So, again, that's something to really think about, especially when we're 
you know, discussing, you know, our case with our physician or discussing our case with our patient, depending on, you know, who's listening to the podcast today, that, you know, making sure that we're sending our patients uh, for appropriate testing so we know which diagnostic imaging and what diagnostic uh, test and treatment to go after is so important. And we'll go to the treatment options, right? So the treatment options for breast cancer, uh, we, we kind of insinuated the lumpectomy, right? Where it says, uh, if your breast cancer tissue is localized, meaning it's in, a, it's in an area that's not spread out, it's not, you know, uh, you know disseminated throughout the body, if it's localized, uh, sometimes we'll actually recommend just taking that area of the tissue out and leaving the breast there. And for various reasons, but of course, cosmetic purposes uh, are huge, right? Because again, if I don't have to take your whole breast out, then I'm not going to take your whole breast out. But that's the cosmetic aspect of it. When we talk about, you know, just from a, uh, a health aspect and, you know, a, a quality of life, a lot of times patients who develop, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of times patients who undergo the mastectomy will sometimes uh, deal with what we call lymphedema, which is you know excess fluid built up in the arms, uh, especially on the side of the mastectomy. And a lot of times, uh, the concern is that you know they do this mastectomy, you know surgery is not foolproof, right? So we have to kind of weigh the pros and cons of is it, if if this is a person who needs to be, you know undergoing a surgical procedure, you know as, as significant as a mastectomy is. And uh, sometimes we'll do that genetic testing, like we t- discussed on the diagnostic options. And again, the genetic testing is really to help guide whether, you know, a lumpectomy is okay, or do I need to take one side of the breast out, or do I need to take both sides of the breast out, right? And, you know, and that's big, right? Because again, from a cosmetic standpoint, you know, it makes a difference. It makes a difference for a woman who you know, may have to lose both her breasts uh, because of cancer, right? And I can tell you from um, a mental health standpoint, sometimes that's usually some of the biggest hurdles for for women is that, you know, after the surgery and understanding that you don't look the same is usually very mentally tolling on them. So that's something that, you know, we want to keep an eye and keep very mindful of when we're recommending treatment because, again, uh, it's it's one thing to go from a lumpectomy, especially because we don't we're not concerned that the breast cancer is going to return. We're not concerned that you know we're going to miss anything. Versus you know doing like a full blown chop off, which is what the mastectomy essentially is, and realizing that we probably didn't have to go that far, right? So that's that balance that you know from a treatment standpoint and and physician aspect. That's the balances we kind of have to weigh. You know, to and from when we're talking about breast cancer. So I wanted to kind of again give this, give a nice little recap on breast cancer, uh, and most importantly, you know, you know why we're wearing pink this month, and honestly, why I want you to keep wearing pink, you know, throughout the rest of the year. So breast cancer, you know, it's again affects one in eight women, one in one thousand men. It's the second leading cause of death in women. Right. You know, biggest risk factors, age, gender, genetics, huge, huge risk factors. Uh, Signs and symptoms, you know, always starts out with, you know, self-care and self-checking of the the breast. Right. And because a lump and mass are usually uh, the two most common complaints that brings a person uh, to the doctor's office. We talked about a couple of patient scenarios today. Uh, One uh, older lady who had no family history but was a heavy smoker. And then we had the second lady who was a very young patient, did not meet the criteria for needing a mammogram. When I say criteria, uh, usually your insurance company will start paying for you to get a mammogram at the age of 40. So once you get 40, you know, they'll start paying for it every year. But in, in our case, the 36-year-old lady, she, she hadn't had... Um, she had the lump, and that's what brought her to the office. But she also had a strong family history. She didn't have like the smoking history, but a huge family history. And she ended up 
having uh, positive genetics for breast cancer and increased risk of breast cancer and actually ended up go undergoing you know the bilateral mastectomy right so yeah one lady the first one who just went uh, who underwent even though she smoked like a chimney all she needed was the lumpectomy versus uh, her second patient a young 36 year old who ended up you know just taking both the breast out because she did not want to have the risk of developing it later and so that's that's kind of where we end with breast cancer again i want to you know thank everyone who's been extremely uh you know informative on breast cancer especially uh in the, the engagement we got on the facebook page uh regarding breast cancer and and, and on that live video stream it was extremely important because again uh the goal is really to try to help educate and get you guys better informed so when you do go to your doctor's office you know you, you, you're not walking out of there more confused than when you walked in because that is such that is something that happens a lot unfortunately where patients walk into the doctor's office and they walk out and they don't really know what happened during the doctor's office right we don't want that right and especially if you're a listener of the lunch and learn i don't want you to walk out of your doctor's office and not know you know what that doctors are talking about not know uh, the disease course and not know you know the treatment course and the plan of actions uh, in, in that regards so again i will see you guys next week like always please please go ahead and head over to itunes and leave me a five-star review tell me what you feel about the episode or any past episode and i'll be glad to hear them and you know, hopefully address them, especially we we can always address our comments on the Facebook page, I guess. Um, but again, you know, go ahead and leave that uh, five star comment and review on Apple iTunes and I'm sorry, on Apple podcast. And I will see you guys next week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry. I want to say thanks again for all that you guys do and all your support and all of your listens. So I want you to kind of keep on keeping on with going ahead and sharing today's episode. Go ahead and subscribe to the podcast if you're not already subscribed to the podcast. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at the same name, Lunch learn pod and uh, go to the website again lunchlearnpod.com for all of the episodes if you've missed one and again i'm at all of the favorite podcast apps google play stitcher soundcloud and of course apple podcast where i would love a five-star review and and tell me what you think about today's episode i would love to hear it so i'll see you guys next week bye